maybe b b before I start my talk, uh, just connect to what uh, has been discussed uh, previously. Uh, understanding language, you know, there's many reasons why this is hard for AIs. Uh, one of them that has been suggested is um, you need to you know, understand what the individual symbols that uh, we use in language actually mean. And um, so this is the famous AI problem of symbol grounding. Um, how do you grind, uh, ground symbols? Um, one of the sort of, sort of thinking around this problem has been that you need bodies because bodies enable you to share experience. Um, so to mean what it, what it, you know, to, to understand what it means to, I don't know, climb a tree, you need to actually have climbed a tree. Uh, if you just manipulate symbols on the internet, it's initially words connecting together, you know, a symbol for climbing and a, a symbol for tree. That doesn't work. You're just, um, uh, you know, connecting words that you really don't understand what the physical experience of doing it actually means. Um, one of the reasons um, I like doing what we do, which is connecting AI and robotics, is that we're giving AI's bodies for the first time, right? We're not a software that lives on the internet and manipulates symbols. We're, and that's what drove us into the field initially, um, we're doing things in the real world. So we have AI's, we essentially throw them into the world, um, find some way to teach them uh, to deal with the world that they need to live in and do something useful in our case because we are a company and we need to make money. Um, but at the end, what you know, got us into the field and what interests us is how do you ground symbols? How do you learn actions and perceptions that are actually a step towards understanding how to act in this world, not the internet. Okay, um, and I've, I've brought a, a couple of applications of you know, what we can uh, do at this point uh, with uh, industrial robots. So uh, most people, especially with a Berlin audience, uh, don't really know much about production or industrial robotics. Uh, I guess that's true here. So if you just listen to the political discourse around the topic, you would assume you know, it's a huge thing. Uh, Angela Merkel talks about uh, you know, the capabilities of the German uh, national economy, and it's all about uh, robots and AI, and we need to keep the knowledge, uh, and we, do not, you know, we must not give the knowledge to the Chinese. And when she does that, I'm always wondering, who's she talking about? I mean, there's KUKA, they make industrial robots, and there's us, I guess, and maybe two or three more startups. She doesn't know us. Um, but, um, you know, AI for industrial robotics really hasn't happened today. Industrial robotics today goes through movements that are, that are completely um, predetermined. The technical word to say it is they're fully understood geometrically. So if you imagine uh, car production, that's something we do a lot in Germany. Uh, in Ingolstadt, where Audi makes, uh, I think, the Q2 or something, um, Audi knows exactly at which point in time a uh, car is where in the factory, uh, and when they move a robot to put a weld line in, they move. They just synchronize the movement of the arm to uh, the movement of the car in the factory, and both of them coincide at the same place. But there's really no coordination or sensors between those two elements of the system, right? So the, there's no perception going on with the robot to know where the car is or do anything meaningful. They just happen to be at the same place at the same time. And that works if you're Audi uh, and can just completely control everything. And you know, go visit the factory. It's awesome. It's a ballet of coordination, and it's super silent, super concentrated. And it is, that's the case because they know exactly where everything is and how it will move at any given point in time. And then you move one step down to the people who make the parts of these cars, um, and it's not a ballet anymore. It's just machines and dudes, um, you know, pushing metal between these uh, machines, and you don't know where everything is. So as soon as you approach a type of problem in production where um, you need to find out where something is to do something, you're out of luck, and you typically today employ a human. So if you want to plug in a cable, for instance, the only thing traditional robotics without AI could do uh, was the following. You get a 3D model of, so say you want to plug in the familiar lightning um, connector into your iPhone. Um, the only thing you could do if you wanted to do this with a robot was you get a 3D model of the phone, you get a very expensive, very complicated 3D camera, and it gives you a point cloud about, you know, the shape of this thing, and then you fit the model into this point cloud very precisely, uh, and then you know, you know the six dimensions of orientation of this phone, um, and then you orient the robot the same, and you make a simple, single, linear, very primitive movement towards it. Essentially, you just orient the robot as the phone is, and then you move forward, and that's it. Right? When we humans plug in cables, that's not what we do. At no point when I have plugged in a cable in my, in my life have I known where this thing is. I don't care. What I do is I just go towards it somehow and wiggle it um, and make small corrective movements as I approach. Uh, 
And this is precisely the capability that we give to robots uh, with our product Mirai. So this is obviously deep learning based. So we have cameras that watch a robot make a movement. And we're doing this with a new type of robot that is easier to deploy because it's less dangerous. Um, traditional industrial robots are very fast, um, very hard, and have completely no perception whatsoever. So if you tell them to go from A to B, um, and between A and B you happen to be, it will kill you, literally kill you. Um, now, with universal robots and some new machines from KUKA and ABB, we have a new class of robots that will at least notif you know, notice uh, when it drives into you and stop, which means it's uh, all of a sudden um, less dangerous to be close to them and you can actually interact uh, with them. And one of the things you can do uh, when you have that capability is you teach them. You show them how a good plugging in movement would look like, and that's exactly what we do when we train a robot to plug in, for instance, a cable into a phone. We grab the robot by the wrist, as you would when you, you know, teach a person to you know, play tennis or uh, play an instrument, and we, we, we guide the robot through the movement while our product Mirai watches with a camera or two. Um, and then after a couple of hours of demonstrations where the robot makes the movement with the trainer and us watching, the data gets sent off to the cloud and back comes a policy that knows how to make the right movement given any of the images that you show, and the robot can make this very complex, real-time correcting movement on its own. So um, before I show you an instance uh, of this, and I will have to do a great deal of explaining of what it is that we're doing there, because production is always very special, um, just the general setup of the system, you buy a robot, any robots, we don't make the robots, right, we're a software company, you buy a robot, for instance, from uh, Universal Robots, you buy a force torque sensor, so you feel the forces on the wrist, you get a camera from us and any type of end effector. You connect all these and there's a tablet app and it's really simple to use. Anybody in this room could train a robot to do a very complex movement and to solve a very complex computer vision problem in production. It's really, we made it super simple to use. You connect all these, you do two hours of training, wait a night, try it out. Typically you iterate this two or three times and you're done. You have a very complex real-time controlled vision-driven system that knows how to find position and end effector towards a visually perceived goal. Okay, this was all the technical terms in one sentence. So we've done, uh, we've done, we've done that. Uh, let's maybe move over to uh, the video so I can uh, show you how this actually looks when you do it. So while the video starts playing, I'm going to explain to you what we're doing there. Um, imagine you're a factory and you make fridges refrigerators, um, and you're a premium brand, so you don't want them to break. Um, the premium brand we're working with here is uh, Liebherr-Miele. Um, what you need to do is make sure no coolant leaks out uh, of the coolant system after production, because if some coolant leaks out after four, week, uh, four weeks, the fridge will break. The way this is done today is there's you know, like 12 soldering points on the back of a fridge where copper tubes that have been put in by humans, so nobody knows where exactly they are and how exactly they look, where copper tubes has, have been con uh, connected through soldering. So this is what the back of a fridge looks like, and this is, these are the connections. Uh, we highlight them now. Right? These connections, um, you don't know exactly where they are, uh, you don't know exactly how they look, and some poor dude, um, his job is to put a sniffing probe, that's a little artificial nose, to any one of those soldering points and try to sniff if some coolant is leaking out there. Um, Nobody wants to do this, and of course, after half an hour, they, they, get, they, get, slop, they get very sloppy. Um, so Lipa has I've tried to automate this for, I think, 20 years or so, and many, many people have failed. Now, with uh, Collaborative Robots and our product Mirai, uh, this was a matter of a week of training the robot and uh, solving it. So um, what you're seeing here is a robot. So this is we're quite close, right? This is like this big in, uh, in reality. This is a simulation of the sniffing probe. Um, we call it an Ameisenbären. You can see why. Um, and this is the camera that watches the scene, and this is the back of the fridge. And uh, with a single uh, RGB color camera, we're going through uh, these movements. So what we did is for each of the uh, individual joints, we trained the robot to find it and touch it, no matter what it looks like and no matter where precisely it is. We know roughly where it is, right? There's a ball in space where it's going to be because most of these fridges are uh, similar when we know the model. But really, the, the, the last two centimeters of the movement are guided by the camera and are 
you know, literally movements like we would make them when we plug in a cable or when we touch one of these things. And the cool thing is this is real time, so you can really mess with the robot um, uh, as it uh, tries to touch these things, and that's uh, what we're doing uh, in the next uh, 30 seconds. Right? So this robot just tries to touch the soldering point, and now I'm just wiggling it about uh, to show that you know, that's all this robot wants to do at this point in time. It wants to stay there and sniff it. That's, uh, that's what's going on. Um, so normally, robotics people get very excited at this point because that's completely unheard of, and nobody's uh, seen it. Real-time control from cameras with a closed-loop control system is not something that anybody outside research is doing, and we've just productized it. Um, right now, I believe we're the only people in the world who can do it, um, especially uh, as, a, as a product. And then, um, you know, while we're messing with the robot anyway, um, I just said, okay, then let's mess with the whole fridge. That's not something that would happen in a factory, and see if yeah, it still performs and finds the, the, uh, and finds the goal. So that's what's, uh, what's happening here. Um, yeah, we need to wait for the video to catch up with me. Right, so robot wants to uh, touch, uh, and then I decide, okay, <laughs> let's uh, let's move that thing about, and um, it just does it. I think we'll uh, see one more. We'll see one more uh, example of this as it moves to the right. Yes, and now I just hit it hard, and um, the robot. Yeah, it needs to go here in this case. Right, and it just approaches, and even as we wiggle it uh, while it moves, uh, we go there. Okay, uh, the rest is um, technical stuff and boring, so we should go back to the uh, presentation. So, this is not about sniffing fridges. The world market for the sniffing fridge application is maybe 15 installations. Um, this is... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's one at Lipamile, there's one at LG, uh, there's one at Whirlpool. Uh, we're talking to all of them after we've done that. <laughs> um, so this is not what it's about, right? This is a highly horizontal product. It's as horizontal as universal robots themselves are. Um, what we do is we take the AI to the actual factory, record the data on site, um, and solve whatever the movement problem that they have there is. Right? So we're not, unlike you know, Siri, where Amazon has trained something and deployed the result, what we're doing is we're deploying the learning system, take it to the factory, record the data there in a very specific manner to the workplace there, the lighting conditions, you know, that there may be oil in the air and chickens running around in the background. You don't know, right? Any of this variance, we learn to deal with on-site, record the data, bring it back to the cloud, create a policy, install it on the robot, and have it work. And this works for essentially anything where you need to hand-eye coordinate a movement. So the way we sell this is we go to a factory and we go to the production engineer and tell them, okay, now let's go through the factory and you show me the people you keep around where you didn't automate, the people you keep around is exclusively for their ability to coordinate how they move with what they see. Because all of this could be done with a robot instead of a person. So yeah, and this is just a technical um, summary of that. Um, here, for those of you who uh, like to see some more videos, here are a couple of um, uh, barcodes uh, where you can see more videos where we do interesting uh, things. This is a case where we plug in Ethernet cables. Um, there is, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the first one is just the whole demo where we also show how the training process looks like. And the second one is a slightly more industrialized case where we're actually, you know, wiring up uh, a 19-inch uh, patch panel where, of course, we in software know where each cable needs to go, otherwise we would just do random things. Uh, but then we drop off the robot uh, in, front of the right, uh, in front of the right socket, uh, and then uh, the Mirai system, our system, does away with the variance. You can even hit the 19-inch rack uh, while it's moving, and it will still reliably plug in. Um, the second one you've just, uh, you've just seen. We have a couple more of these. Uh, if you're interested, uh, follow us. Um, there will be more on the website uh, quite soon. We can do this with uh, essentially all the universal robots machines. There's six of them right now, three different sizes, and then uh, slightly different equipment. If uh, we need more speed, um, more uh, power, and a bit more danger, uh, we can also do this with ABB robots. We're in no form bound to collaborative robots. Uh, it just happens to be the case right now, the market is crazy about them and uh, buys universal robots in large numbers. So most of the requests we get today are not for traditional ABB fast machines, but for non-dangerous universal robots machines. 
Uh, two words about the company. Uh, we've been founded in 2014. We're sort of a weird animal. We're really AI people. So, you know, the discussion about artificial general intelligence and how to make language understanding or understanding anything at all instead of just predicting stuff um, is really close to our heart. It's really, you know, long term what I want to do in my life. Um, and this is essentially a vehicle for me to you know, make some money on the side. Um, we spent two years between 2014 and 2016 um, figuring out how doing AI in Germany makes sense, right? If you, if you do AI and you have a bunch of good people and you have a bunch of algorithms that, are, that, that make sense, how, you do you do, how do you do something where you learn something from the people around you um, and it wouldn't make more sense to do this in Israel or Silicon Valley um, or at least in the UK? And industrial robotics or production topics are sort of a natural match for us, and that's how we ended up uh, doing this. We're 20 ish people now in Berlin with a sales office in New York. Uh, we're venture backed by uh, Project A, who have invested in November last year, Coparian and uh, Vito. So, you know, all of these, um, these guys are very good operationally, which helps us a lot, and these guys obviously are you know, close to um, uh, just production issues uh, and help us a lot there. Um, that's me. Um, I talk about robotics and AI on LinkedIn sometimes, so if you want to follow me, um, and uh, I'll now be ready to take any questions you might have. Okay. Um, so the first questions, let's start here with Tobias. Um, yes, thanks for the um, talk. Uh, very interesting stuff. And um, uh, since we are building sensors for robots, I also got pretty excited looking at some of oh, those okay. uh, that data. What are you working I, for? Uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a talk like in the one of the after the next. So, okay. um, um, so, so what I'm the, the capability is pretty strong, um, um, and I think uh, matching uh, yeah hand-eye coordination from a robot's perspective um, um, can be transferred to a lot of other things robo robots do. Um, uh, so, so, how difficult would it be um, to, yeah, the, the, to, 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 to transfer this mechanism into an autonomous driving system, for example, because that's something yeah. we're looking into. Yeah. Um, so, so, how can that help? So, the, you know, the, the, the machine learning and the algorithms, they are very generic. So, let's not go to autonomous, autonomous driving right away, but people have approached us about, like, uh, harbor cranes. You know, this is essentially a 4D movement, everything jiggles about, um, and placing containers into moving container ships is a high-end skill that you need high tra highly trained operators for. Uh, the algorithms could totally do it. The company, alas, not. You know, we need to focus at least on robotics. This is wide enough. Um, so I, I, unfortunately, I need to say no uh, to people who want to do harbor cranes and diggers and you know, whatever else um, I have been approached about. Um, there will be, however, a generic Cartesian interface um, that we add to the product where, if, as long as you don't tell us, uh, you're free to um, you know, try to hand, or whatever your actuator is, actuator camera coordinate essentially any movement, and then if it works, good for you, uh, that's excellent. So I believe by the end of the year we will have this generic interface with an API that you can buy one of these, uh, you connect whatever your cameras are, um, and you connect whatever your machine is, that you want to coordinate and just try it and do that. Autonomous driving, I think, is different um, because it's more complex and layered. Right? These are very, these are very monolithic skills. Um, I think um, autonomous driving is typically <laughs> skills and layers of skills on top of each other, interfering with each other and trying to prevent errors. Um, in the autonomous autonomous driving space, we're strongly on you know Elon's side. Um, cameras work. This world is designed by humans for sensors that are human, which means RGB, not radar or anything else. So the most information in pretty much any case where you want to act in the world, you get from RGB data. Um, the spectrum is there, it's usually free, nobody messes with it. Um, so as long as you can deal with shadows and sunlight, and we're getting very close with this stuff, I mean, most of the applications we do work in direct sunlight, uh, as long as you don't you know, completely overdo it. Um, so, I think the visible uh, spectrum is just the best sensor modality for anything that interacts with the world, with humans in it, which is the world. Great. Any other question? There's one.
Hi, thanks for the presentation. I'm Rafael from Siemens AG. Um, I have a few questions. So one, uh, if you're really using reinforcement learning to do this, and if you are, how you're handling also the transfer learning for other machines. So if you teach one machine, yes. how can you transfer that to multiple lines? And how you're also running that locally? Are you providing your own hardware, or you're yeah. working with third-party <laughs> hardware? Yeah, a Siemens person would ask that. Um, so is it reinforcement learning? The answer is no, not at all. Um, there has been a great deal of excitement around uh, reinforcement learning. The problem is for industrial use cases, you do not have the data in reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, you need to be able to roll out to multiple machines. So you know, Google X did this, uh, I think, 2015 or so. They put like 20 robots in a basement and had them rehearse uh, gripping uh, of random objects. And what they got out of it was a mildly impressive gripping demo, and they spent four months and 20 robots on it. I cannot propose this to anybody making fridges, right? They buy a robot, they want to start right away. So the only way to make reinforcement learning work means simulation. Uh, so you uh, essentially need to do some form of randomization and treat reality as some weird form of uh, the simulation that you've, uh, that you've trained in. I believe there's something there, but this also means you need to build the simulation first. In a production context, for many of the things that happen in factory, nobody has a simulation. Nobody, nobody has even heard of it, right? Could I have come up with uh, this demo where we sniff copper tubes on a fridge half a year ago before I had met the, 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 the Leaper people? Hell no. I had no clue that this is going on. Has anybody uh, you know, a meaningful simulation for the contact forces that are going on there? Absolutely no, too. So as long as nobody figures out how to just take a snapshot of a room and get a decent physical simulation out of it, uh, we have a strong belief that using reality as its own model um, is the best thing to do, and that's what we're doing here. We're recording all the data we learned from on-site at the actual thing. Transferring between different machines, you need to make sure that the variance that you see between individual work sp work spa uh, workspaces has been oh yeah I'm over time no, don't, has been don't. Uh, has been has been shown during training right uh, if you do that you can do it it makes the learning more complex uh, the other way to do it is just make you know make 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 the individual working stations look exactly the same mm. we are bringing hardware. Um, not out of, you know, we have no passion for this whatsoever. It's just we need GPUs. There's no GPUs um, in any production context today. So what we're, we're selling this essentially, what we're doing there is we're selling a software license as a little box. Um, the little box is essentially a gaming PC it, uh, that never updates. Uh, it, it, brings a, it brings a GPU, and that allows us to do it. Mm -hmm. I believe, you know, once Siemens and Hewlett Packard Enterprise and uh, all the big guys um, have had their IoT wars, um, in a couple of years, we will know what the type of accelerated uh, neural network inference architecture there will be in factories, and we'll be perfectly happy to run on this one. Right now, you need to buy a piece of kit and connect to your robot.